This episode of the Mac Rumor Show podcast is sponsored by Banktivity. Welcome back to another episode of the Mac Rumor Show. Of course, I am Dan, and I'm joined by Hartley. And I also have another special guest today. Uh, we have Thomas Frank, who, in my mind, is, you know, and, and, and a lot of other people's minds, a productivity guru. Um, he, I don't know if you like the term YouTuber, but I'm going to throw it out there. YouTuber, podcaster, you also, I didn't know this. You were, you're, are you co-owner or the owner of Nebula? Uh, co-owner. That's really awesome. Yeah. That's a really cool place to see some exclusive content. So you can see his content on YouTube, but also on Nebula. And so, and you also do Skillshare classes, which is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the main reasons why we wanted to bring you on here is because we wanted to talk a lot about um, the iPad as a productivity tool. Um, and so let's just jump right into that. And sure. are you still using your iPad Pro as one of your main devices, or have you been bouncing around back and forth between other things? Like, how's that working out Currently, with you when you set up? Currently, I ha am not using the iPad Pro as one of my main devices. So I thought it was actually kind of interesting when you reached out to like pitch this whole idea as iPad Pro as a productivity device. I definitely have thoughts on it. And I think there are certain uses where it is the best device for certain tasks. Uh, what I've been doing recently has been all product development for the Notion templates we're selling, um, a little bit of script writing, a lot of technical writing, and that tends to do better on a, I guess a MacBook or a desktop PC or whatever it is. In the past, when I was doing in-depth research for videos where I was going through long PDFs, articles, and needing to make highlights, that's where I find the iPad to be the absolute best device. And we can get into why, but I guess to just kick this off, I have a bit of a nuanced opinion about this. Uh, I was also very frustrated with my iPad over my honeymoon because I decided to learn JavaScript and uh, getting a code editor with like a built-in uh, what do they call that? Like Node.js installation and all that kind of stuff. It is possible on the iPad now as of very recently, but it's still not quite as good of an experience as you get on a true computer. So how would you sort of, if you were to evaluate the iPad for the average person, would you say that for the average person's productivity needs, the iPad sort of enhances that? Or would you say that it actually makes life harder? Because I think that's the reason why a lot of us in the tech space have a bit of a nuanced opinion on the iPad. Because yeah. for some so people, talking, it definitely can be great. Are we talking as your sole device as a computer replacement or as an add-on? Well, I mean, personally, I think the iPad is best as an accompaniment to a MacBook. I think that's how mm. Apple has seen it. And I think that's why they've had a lot of problems kind of envisaging where the iPad goes. Um, so yeah. I would say as an accompaniment. Yeah, I mean, I think as an accompaniment, like you immediately get the addition of a second monitor in your backpack when you use, what do they call that? Sidecar? Sidecar, or, yeah. yes. Or maybe it's just like screen mirroring at this point. Uh, so that's already a productivity boost, especially if you do any kind of uh, work that benefits from a secondary monitor. But then there are certain things where the iPad is a better device. I think it's, it, they're niche things. So you know, if you put me on the spot and you're like, what device is such, uh, should somebody get? It's back to school time right now. I'm debating iPad versus MacBook. I'm gonna say go MacBook all the way. It's overall a more capable device. Um, you're gonna have like an easier time typing in any situation. It's just, you know, easier to use in my opinion. Where the iPad shines though is number one, if you're doing any kind of art or drawing, my wife is an artist. She is on her iPad all the time. Uh, she also has like a Wacom tablet but that has to like stay stuck to her desktop computer. The iPad, she can do pro level art anywhere. That's pretty great. And then um, the fact that you can use the Apple Pencil to take handwritten notes and also take highlights, it just, in my opinion, works quite a bit better than trying to take highlights on uh, a computer. And there's like an even more nuanced reason for that because you know with a mouse, I can make a highlight very easily, but there is an app on the iPad that does something no current desktop app does. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, we're, we're, we're going to solve this hopefully in the future, but there's an app called Command. It's a web browser. It's only on iOS. And you can make highlights that persist when you refresh web pages. You can add annotations to those highlights, and then you can sync those highlights to Notion or Rome Research or Readwise or whatever you want. And there's currently on desktop platforms, nothing that does all three of those well. There is okay. an open source uh, browser add-on called Hypothesis that gets the closest I've seen, but nothing is quite as good as that command browser on the iPad. 
So if you're like a researcher who wants to go back to the articles that you've made highlights in to get the context, there's nothing better. Do you know why that is? Was, was that just a decision of the developers or did they, did they see iPad as having that potential? So I've talked to the developers, uh, the lead developers named Ash, Ash Bot, I think his name is. Um, they wanted to start with iOS. I don't know their exact reasoning, but then they've said they, they have intentions to hopefully branch out to browser extensions or maybe even full desktop browsers. But you got to start somewhere. And they were iOS developers first and foremost. Uh, they wanted to make a browser that was intended for researchers and writers and people like that. So it's built first and foremost with those highlighting and note taking features. Uh, built in. I think that makes sense because undoubtedly note taking is one of those really strong areas of the iPad, especially when it comes to ha not just handwritten notes, but just uh, drawing diagrams. I think for, for students in particular, we that study subjects that require a lot of drawing of diagrams and um, you know, simple sketches and that sort of thing. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it opens up a dimension that you just can't quite get close to with a MacBook. And yet if you're yes. studying a very, uh, a very sort of um, text heavy um, subject with no with no capacity really to be drawing diagrams. Ultimately, I would say a MacBook would be better. Yeah, but it's it's, mean, not, when, it's not a simple clear cut thing. No, when I was in college, it was the laptop on one side of the desk in the lecture hall and a paper notebook on the other side. And I experimented with all kinds of weird, quirky things that tried to meld the two. There was one called the Rocket Book where it was an erasable notebook, about yeah, 30 pages. I remember. I remember and then that. there were like these icons at the bottom of the page that you could mark and then you'd scan it with their app and it would automatically upload it to the correct Evernote notebook uh, based on what you set up, which is an interesting concept. I found the pages were kind of hard to write on versus yep. regular paper. So I just ended up sticking with regular notebook paper. And it wasn't until the Notability app specifically on the iPad that I found a handwriting smoothing algorithm that felt good enough where I was like, okay, I could actually see myself taking handwritten notes on an iPad uh, in, uh, or I guess versus a paper notebook. Rumor has it there's a band of renegade Mac developers in the woods of Vermont who have made it their mission to help people make the most of their money. They're called IGG Software and they created Banktivity, a powerful suite of Mac iOS-based personal financial tools. And from what I hear, it's helping people everywhere work towards all sorts of financial goals. Banktivity pulls all your bank accounts, investments, credit cards, monthly bills into one complete picture. So you always know what's coming in and going out. And then from there, you decide what financial goals you want to focus on. You can pay down debt, you can have savings for a down payment, a college fund or retirement, Banktivity's goals tool will ask you how much you want to save and by when, and then you will tell it how much you want to save each month. Coupled with the envelope budgeting feature, you'll be able to prioritize your goals and track your progress across all of your devices. So it's more than easy to use and it's super secure. All your data is encrypted end to end. No one but you can access it, not even the people at Banktivity. Subscriptions start at less than 50 bucks a year and now MacRumors listeners can get 20% off their first year. Just click the link in the description and you'll start saving on and with Banktivity today. Uh, so I, and I still think we're in a transition phase. One of the things I would love to see that will hopefully get us out of it is uh, Notability or some similar quality handwriting app having automatic sync to the big note taking apps like Evernote or Notion or OneNote or what have you. Currently we don't have that. Uh, the last time I tried Apple Notes, the handwriting smoothing wasn't quite up to my standards. So it seems like we're sort of siloed at the moment. I just don't think it's a great option for handwriting stuff. I mean, if you're doing something super quick, yeah, I mean, it's totally fine. If you're literally using it as like a quick, you know, yellow legal pad note style, you just, you don't need organization or anything, but like they need to definitely develop around that. Um, I feel like Apple Notes could be a huge competitor to all these really great third-party apps if they like invested just a little bit of time to making it work well with, you know, the Apple Pencil. Um, mm. And then, but they did, you know, show off at the keynote for WWDC some other apps like Freeform. Was it Freeform, right? That's what they call it or what they're calling mm. it? Partly. Yes, that's coming soon. Yeah. Have you had a chance to like, I mean, no one's tested it out yet. It's just not coming out yet. But like, have you had a chance to take a look at that? Like, is that something that could kind of pique your interest as someone who might want to go back to using that then? I actually haven't looked at that. 
Um, oh, okay. So like the context for me is I'm all in on Notion at this point, and that's because I can merge task management, project management with my note taking in one app that's cross platform. I also, and this might be sacrilege for you guys, but I use Windows and Mac OS on a daily basis. Uh, so I need something that's on both. Uh, and if Apple would just get in on the game development area, then I would happily ditch Windows forever, but they just, they're not there yet. So I'm okay, kind of so on both. A couple of side notes. <laughs> One, I agree with you. I've been toying around with the idea of like building a PC just to play games, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I just can't. I I can't pull myself around to doing it, and I'm just like, oh, I'll just settle with the Xbox and be done with it. So, <laughs> first question: What games are you uh, not able to leave because of this? Why are you not able to ditch uh, your your Windows PC? It's actually one game, Overwatch. Okay. And I I, I don't even play the second one yet. I play the <laughs> old one. And I play only like the stupidest arcade mode where everyone's bad, but I've got a core group of friends we love to play and you just can't play it on a Mac. I've seen people try to run it in parallels and bootcamp. It just, it does not work. Yeah. So I, I don't want to do that either. And like, I only play one game too, like a lot and that's Call of Duty, which you can play on console and that's what I've been doing. But mm -hmm. you're at such a disadvantage compared to people on PC. It's just not even funny. And like when we do those cross lobbies, it it stinks. So I've been toying around that idea. But yeah, I wish Apple would get into game development, not to go off topic here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even remember what my second question was now and related to that. Um, <laughs> but there's one other thing, though. And I was like flabbergasted. I was looking at the Mac Studio and it doesn't support 120 hertz or anything over 60 hertz. And I'm just like, yeah. it, it's 2022. Where's the high refresh monitor support, especially since they built it into the MacBook Pro and they're <laughs> selling their own high-end monitors that cost more than anyone else's monitors. Like, what's the deal? And that's the weird thing is like, if they were to do another update to the studio display um, or the Pro Display XDR, like if they do that and they, you know, bump up the refresh rate, then you just alienated half the, I'm guessing that'll be coming alongside the Mac Pro uh, later mm -hmm. this year, if ever, if that ever does come out. Um, but, you know, I think we are going to focus on iPad, but I do kind of want to talk about Notion a little bit because I'm going to put use in quotes. We're using Notion for some things. And I was just mm -hmm. talking about this before you came on with Hartley. Um, I was just talking about this with him. I want to love Notion. So, like, I love the idea of it. I love all the things you can do, but I'm so overwhelmed, just so overwhelmed with mm -hmm. all the stuff. And we're, we don't use it company-wide. We don't really use anything company-wide. And I feel like if, A, we were able to adopt it company-wide and, like, we used it as a Mac Rumors, like, team together, that would be super helpful. You know, everybody, we can keep track of what everybody else is doing and kind of figure out people's schedules and see things and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if we can do that, and then if I can figure out the best way to, like, I don't really love the way it's, on, like, kind of, looks on your iPhone. Like, it's great on a Mac, but, like, other than that, I'm not a huge fan of iPad. It's fine on the iPad. It's definitely better on your on your iPad compared to, like, iOS, but there needs to be yeah. a more condensed, lesser version of it on iOS. Do you agree? Uh, there are some UI tweaks I would love to see for iOS. Yeah. Um, I have been using Notion for four <laughs> or five years now, so I've learned quite a few tricks to make my stuff work well on iOS. It's still not quite the same UI you're going to get with like Apple Notes or Todoist or anything that's natively made for uh, a mobile experience. But there's a couple of things you can do. So like one thing I will do is I'll create dashboards that are good for the desktop experience. But because I can just show those exact same database views in other places, I'll make mobile optimized single use pages. So for example, I have like on my desktop, a note taking hub where I can see favorites, I can see recents, I can see my folders just kind of like you'd have on Evernote or Apple Notes. I I can access that on the mobile app, but I've created a page for each one of those things as well. So I can instantly just go, boom, to recents, and I just have that list of recent notes, nothing else, it, everything gets out of my way. So that's one thing you can do. I like to put a table of contents at the top of each page too, so I can just instantly zoom down to the section I want as well. There's little tricks you can use, but I definitely agree, like, it's... It's an all-in-one tool, which necessarily means it's going to take longer to get to the point where it's as usable in X or Y instance as a single-purpose tool is. I remember in high school, uh, I was super anti-iPod to the point where I <laughs> hung out on a forum called anythingbutipod.com. <laughs> and it's very funny. I've come full circle. Nice. I have like literally every Apple device at this point. But I can't wait to back see the in comments high school, on that one. 
I know, right? <laughs> so this was this was like 2007. The iPod video was out and it didn't support, uh, I think it was AVI video files. And I was like, why the heck can I only get video files off iTunes? This is dumb. I want to have YouTube videos or whatever. So I had a creative Zen Vision M. And then that was just like my gateway in there uh, to this forum where everyone was saying, this, this is their biggest take uh, when the iPhone came out. Why would you want one device that plays music and makes phone calls because it's going to be bad at both so much better to have a cell phone in one pocket and an mp3 player in the other pocket and back then they were correct but now anybody who has that kind of take you're going to think is a luddite or like maybe they really just love their og vorbis files <laughs> but like the majority of us know that an iphone is the best way to both make calls and to listen to music i got spotify i got apple music whatever i want that doesn't come on a dedicated mp3 player so I kind of had this evolution in thinking from when I was younger thinking, yes, single purpose devices are always going to be better. Why have an all in one tool like a Leatherman is never going to have as good of a knife as a hunting knife. And it's never going to have as good of a screwdriver as a screwdriver. But now like with tech, I realize give it enough time. And sometimes you're proven wrong on that belief. Sometimes you do get a device that can do literally everything. And I think in terms of uh, no code and builder platforms, like with notion, we're going to get there too. To some extent, that is to go kind of full circle back to the iPad. That was the the vision behind the iPad to kind of merge the Mac and the iPhone to kind of provide mm -hmm. that intermediary experience. And one thing that I think comes from that that is quite a unique productivity benefit is actually the way that iPad OS is designed to be a limited experience. Mm -hmm. It's somehow more um, at least I find it to be a lot more distraction free and a lot more easy to just um, you know get engaged with. Um, if I want to if I, if I have tasks I need to work through, I have a higher chance of being able to process those tasks um, in the sort of singular experience of iPad OS. That's 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 my experience. Whether iPad OS is any good at doing it is a, is a different question um, yeah because very often you could you can hit other roadblocks but it's the actual kind of idea of Things don't get in your way in quite the same way with iPadOS because it is seen as that 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 sort of third direction. Um, and I'm sure we'll discuss Stage Manager and how it can get complicated when Apple is trying to do that. Uh, but I was interested in in your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that. So let's get into that. So I have convinced myself on probably two different occasions to purchase an iPad. Uh, because I think it's going to be a more limited experience and it'll be more distraction free. There are, I guess there's some truth to that, but then there's also, um, the fact that some tasks are just much slower on an iPad. And when each individual action takes a lot longer, you get out of the flow and you don't want to do it there. So for instance, like coding is just way harder on an iPad. Um, building notion templates way harder on ipad video editing way harder on ipad and i cannot get into the flow of video editing on an ipad app like i can with my windows computer it's just i have pro tools um you know it is true that you have the the fact that i can reduce distractions but also if you're doing work where the device makes every action slower or more of a hindrance then you're going to be taken out of the flow and it's going to be much harder to actually stay on task the other thing is um this is for the individual to sort of ponder, but are you actually going to be more productive? Is it actually going to reduce distractions or are you simply convincing yourself that that is going to happen because it's a justification to buy the new shiny device? And I'm that not one. judging any individual that person. One. I just want to say like, think about that before you choose to spend a thousand dollars. See, for me, I think this is where the iPad as an accompaniment to the Mac comes in because I have hit the iPad's limits in enough places. And I know the things, even the simple things, because you know, I, I don't do any video editing. I don't even attempt that on the iPad. Um, I don't attempt any sort of ostensibly pro tasks, but you hit walls with simple things, even in mm -hmm. task managers or calendar, you know your limits with these things. So yeah. I find if I know what tasks um, are great on the iPad, things like processing email is really, really good. So every day I start my day by um, you know reviewing my calendar, processing my, um, uh, my inboxes, things like that um, is a great way to start the day on an iPad. It's there's something about the uh, the direct touch input, and then later in the day when I come to actually doing the work, um, that obviously is done on a Mac. But 
for mm. me, that's kind of one place where it fits in. Or, you know, if I'm sick of sitting at my desk, I'm sick of, uh, you know, being in front of the keyboard, being able to just go and sit elsewhere with a smaller device, um, it means that I can kind of get a little bit more uh, attention span out of myself. Mm. So when it's when it's viewed as an accompaniment like that, but I guess I'm willing to to spend the time to know where those those limits are. And I know if I want to have a repeating task in, in Things 3 that's more than 14 days, or there's this arbitrary limit of 14 days on iPad, but there isn't on Mac. So I know I've got to use the Mac for that. Um, so it's kind of learning the limits, I guess. It won't let you make a recurring task that's more than 14 days out, specifically on the iPad app? That's yep. such a weird limitation. <laughs> They're like yeah, people that you, use you the iPad aren't thinking, aren't thinking past two weeks, sorry. That's like... And it's like, if you want to say this repeats once a month, you can't do it. You can do um, once a month, but more than 14 days. Like when you're using the days um, selector, that's it. And sometimes I want to do so you know, 16 days or, or whatever. Yeah. I wonder if their data model is representing and showing that task on every future day instead of simply moving the due date to the next day each day. Maybe that's it's like a performance thing. I'm not sure. I'm honestly not. I'm not sure, but there's these other, you know, it's even things like in things three, um, tags don't display. You have to actually tap on tasks to see mm. their tags and things like that, you know, they don't really matter. You can still use it just the same, but they slow you down. So yes. I know if I want to, you know, um, process my inbox, iPad's great. If I want to, you know, select some tasks, move some things around, it's great, but I know those little limits. And I mm. think that's what causes people a lot of frustration because they're across the platform really. Yeah. I remember, uh, or I guess the funny thing is, um, for me, I was going to say processing my my inbox is one of the worst things on the iPad, but I'm guessing it's a, it's a difference in the apps that we use because I use Front, which is a very team focused uh, email client, and they still have not implemented their keyboard shortcuts on the iPad. Uh, but the other thing is, I feel like email it's it's mostly crap that I'm just deleting, or hopefully my assistant deletes. But a lot of it is a little mini task that it forces me to go over to something else, and then the iPad becomes um, a slowdown point yet again, because now I'm trying to switch apps really quickly and I don't have as much space for split screen. It just, it just seems like for me, I can get my email done a lot faster on a big computer. Yeah, I suppose, you know, it varies depending on these specific use cases and for sure there's Apple is trying to acknowledge some of these limitations, you know, um, we were going to talk about it a little later, but it seems like a good time to bring it up now, which is the desktop class apps framework, which is introducing things like uh, system wide copy and paste system wide search system wide find and replace um, so that these things are consistent. And the, the strange thing is there's all this excitement about iPad OS 16 and uh, stage manager. And yet the biggest difference, the biggest upgrade for me in iPad OS 16 is literally that you can copy and paste calendar events using the keyboard. That's it. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. It shows how small like these changes need to be yeah. because for years it just wasn't, it wasn't usable. It wasn't viable for that reason. Yeah. I mean, everyone has little individual use cases. But uh, I guess the problem from a product design standpoint is you're delivering to millions of users who all have their little things they want and making them all work in harmony and prioritizing them. That's the hard part. And that's why it seems to be in the in the shadow of the Mac this whole time, because the Mac is such mm. a mature platform. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's we're talking about desktop operating systems, which are at this point, what, like going on 50 years old? <laughs> Yeah. versus uh, a platform that is 11 years old. So just a, a huge difference in maturity. So what about the feature that is uh, that Apple is hoping to appeal to a much larger audience in Stage Manager? Have you had a chance to mess around with that at all? So you guys are going to have to educate me because I actually don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, man. All right. This is great. So Stage Manager is basically the ability to not only resize Windows, finally, um, and be able to have, you know, multiple windows, a true multi-window experience, basically. So you can mm -hmm. have multiple floating windows around. Um, and basically how they did it was they put, like, the apps on the left-hand side as, like, a column that you can kind of switch to. And then your mm -hmm. center stage area is where you would, you know, pick your groupings of apps that you would have. So you could have, you know, Notion and your calendar app, and you can resize them to be slightly different sizes. There's still control via Apple's, like, kind of, I don't know, frames and how they want you to do it, but at least there's a little bit of customization there. 
Um, and mm-hmm. then, you know, you can have different groupings and then those groupings will save off to that column. So if you have Notion and, uh, what did I say, Calendar, that will be the, the grouping on the side here. And then you can switch and add in and take out whatever you want. It's very buggy, so it's really hard for me to to give my proper thoughts on it. But um, yeah. is that something that would bring you back to the iPad then? I would certainly try it out. I mean, yeah. I, I spent my entire honeymoon on the iPad not using a laptop at all because it was just <clears> easier to bring out to the pool. <laughs> so <laughs> there are definitely contexts in which it makes more sense. I mean, the iPad definitely kills it in the like casual, you know, browsing the web, Twitter, whatever, if you want a larger screen. And then obviously media. Like, Mm -hmm. it's still a reason why I travel with an iPad and a MacBook and use my iPad strictly for, you know, if I'm not doing any work on the plane, then I'll just use that. If I want to browse the web, watch TV, like, it is kind of hard to beat in that aspect. The one thing I will say is, so I used the iPad and I had the the M1 Mac Pro or Mac Pro 16, which is just this big honking beast. If you're on an airplane... Don't try to do any work on it. No. I recently got the M2 Air. It's so good. Uh, it's amazing. It's my it's favorite so computer good. ever. And the moment I got it, I'm just like, okay, number one, I don't understand the hate and the, the lukewarm reception and the reviews. I've heard some people say like, oh, it's because tech YouTube is not getting views right now. So people are trying to be contrarian. Maybe it's that. I don't Probably know. Probably true. <laughs> but it's such a good device. And it's so small. It's, it's, I think it's lighter than my iPad Pro, my 11 inch. I can't tell, but it feels lighter, certainly with the keyboard case on. And it was just sort of this instant like, okay, now what do I use the iPad for? <laughs> because this is all the size problems I had with the Pro are gone. So I like to call the iPad my favorite device that I want to use, but rarely ever do. Um, mm-hmm. Unless I'm traveling, it is kind of just sits here. And then every once in a while, I'm like, Hartley, I feel inspired. I'm going to go to a coffee shop. I'm just going to take that. It's a little distraction free for the most part. You know, it is a little less um, obtrusive in some ways, but like, I don't know. Then about a half hour in, I'm like, well, I need to use my Mac for something. So I guess I'll take that out. Um, yeah. But ever since the Air. So the first Air that we got right away, I, I, I ordered two. I did the, the base model because it was the only one that was going to come right away. And I feel like that was one that would appeal to a lot of people. And then the second one that I just got a few weeks ago was kind of maxed out. I didn't get the full um, SSD storage. Just just a terabyte was fine. But I did get Mm. 24 gigs of RAM, and it does have the 10-core GPU. And honestly, I haven't done this yet. I'm going to do a full video, so this is a spoiler for anybody. It might replace my 16-inch MacBook Pro. And I'm not saying that in terms of performance. I'm saying that in terms of traveling around and editing video. It, it, I went on oh, a trip yeah. to New York. I edited a few videos on it. It worked perfectly fine. Way better than when I tried it on the base model. The base model could handle basic edits, but after a while, you start adding in LUTs and stuff, and it really kind of slowed down a little bit. But with this... And are I mean, you using Final Cut? Yes. Okay, because that's, I mean, that's so optimized for the M1 chip, it almost doesn't matter. But even that then, I was still finding it. ways, and this is without proxy media. I know people can, I can make a proxy and then it just becomes easier, but I yeah. like to do it without just because of space and everything. And, yep. uh, and so it was, I still haven't had a hiccup on it. Obviously there's no fans that are kicking on. Um, it's so light that honestly, I think, I think it might replace it as my go-to in which case then I'm like, well, maybe I should just use it as my go-to for everything and start mm-hmm. dealing with using web apps for media and just streaming media that way. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, Apple has that whole 15 day return policy. So when the M2 came out, I'm like, well, I've already got the M1 pro, but I just am a little annoyed with the size. I'm going to try out the M2 and we'll see. And I'm like, Thinking to myself, the screen's not going to be big enough. I know, and, I, and I'm going to miss the true motion, high refresh rate and all that. I have not opened the M1 Max since I got the M2. Not once. <laughs> kind of how I feel. So I'm going to wipe it and I'm going to sell it. And you know, part of it is I don't edit video anymore. I've got an editor for that and he's got a beefy Windows computer over on the other side of this room. Yeah. Um, everything I'm doing is like Notion design at this point. But... Even that I was worried about because there, you just have a lot more screen real estate to work on with uh, the M1. But that the size differential, the weight differential, just how easy it is to carry around, the battery life difference is just insane. It's just insanely better on the M2. I, I agree. And so because you used to use the iPad a lot and now you've switched, we're going we're gonna to tailor this whole thing up. This is just going to be kind of an Apple uh, productivity episode. And, and, and I do want to stick with the Mac for a minute. Uh, and especially the M2, do you find, there have been people that have been saying that 
you know, the M2 MacBook Air is great, but, and then they'd insert, some, and some of the things that I've been seeing lately has been the keyboard. A lot of keyboard hate. What's wrong with the keyboard? I have no problems with I the keyboard. I love it. Yeah. I think it's great. To me, it, I mean, I guess it's not technically identical to the MacBook Pro, but. It's close enough. There's never been a moment where I'm typing on it think and, and have thought this is better than or worse than any other MacBook. They're all <clears> fine. <throat> I guess, wasn't there like a time in like the 2017, 18 period where there was a switch in the way they were doing the board? Yeah, the butterfly keys were not well received. I personally okay. loved them, but that was me. I thought those were fine too. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's ever been a MacBook keyboard that I've been disappointed with i mean this also goes back to the fact like i came from a windows background my first college laptop was a windows computer and then i finally i went to a big gaming laptop and then i finally got my first macbook and i went holy crap nobody who's making windows pcs can even compete on the same plane of existence with this computer but I, you know i've never been able to get myself to move fully over because i do like games right so it's just been hard to complain about really anything that apple's done with the macbook because no matter what they've done it's still like light years better than any windows pc <laughs> and that's sort of my base frame of reference from when i started using laptops and not to be like pandering to apple and, and kind of sucking up to them but i mean you got to give credit where it's due the intel switch over to m2 i mean could not have gone any better uh yeah per performance has been incredible I, there was no way I could see myself saying that I'm going to use the Intel MacBook Air over my MacBook Pro. Like that was never going to be a thought in my mind and is yeah. not a thought in my mind. But now you can very realistically just get away with using an, a MacBook Air uh, for mm -hmm. most tasks, for most people. The one thing I did find, and I don't, I don't know how you guys covered this when the I think the first M1 came out, but a lot of other YouTubers were saying even the base M1 with eight gigabytes is going to be amazing for everything. And I vehemently disagree about that. I ran into the eight gigabyte RAM limit so many times with my first M1. So, you know, I think the processor is great. You do need to spec up your RAM though, if you're doing like anything more than a, a couple browser tabs open. I think 16 and at minimum 512, but I think the perfect model for those who are listening Get 16, get a terabyte. You'll be happy. You'll be thankful. Mm -hmm. um, I went 24, and I think that's probably overkill. But, like, again, I have not had a single issue. Haven't run into any anything. Nothing has slowed down. It literally feels like I'm using the M1 Max MacBook Pro to me. I've had yep. no issues. It's early. Yep, it's, but I've, it's the same for me. Yeah. Hartley, what do you think? Do well, we I, I would agree. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I agree. I think that... Um, the M1 is not as capable as people initially thought it was. It was deceptive because where it's so well optimized with macOS, you could open every app on the device and they'd all open instantly and you kind of would feel like it was snappier. But even um, you know, in my line of work where it's mainly just browser tabs um, and just word processing, ultimately mm -hmm. I hit limits with the M1 very quickly. And I notice differences when I use an M1 <coughs> Pro machine over an M1. Um, I, it, it really, I don't see the beach ball at all. Whereas M1, I do, even with 16 gigs of RAM. So yeah. it's, it, it is something where I kind of can see why the chip lineup is forming as it is. Um, I think that there, there are now devices for basically everyone. Um, and they're, 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 they're well targeted in a way that they weren't before. The mm -hmm. iPad, of course, is the, the outlier here because we're expecting the iPad to get M2, but we're not seeing this power leveraged Right, um, because the, the software just isn't there. I don't. It's think. a waste. Stage of power. manager, stage manager is only available on M1 iPads, so you have to have the latest iPad models to be able to use mm. um, this sort of productivity focused feature, um, which has been quite controversial. Um, but I think that it does make a difference. I don't know. I don't. Dan, have you used it very much? Stage manager. Yes. No. Because I didn't like it when I first used it, but I really like it now. It's right, really growing on me. Give it more of a chance. It's just, just the ability to use four apps at once on the iPad in windows that you can choose. Like if you're listening to a podcast, you can put it in a little window in the top left corner. And then like that it's, great. It, it makes it feel natural. Here's my but, issue with it. Yeah, Here's it's my great. issue with in it. I don't ways. know. Have they fixed it since then is the, is the, the real question. Because you know I used it initially when it came out and then... I've been using that iPad with the beta on it, but I just haven't remembered to go to it. 
is there a keyboard shortcut? Is there a faster way to get into it? Because right now you have to go into Control Center and toggle it on that way. Have they updated that yet? No. If you leave it on, um, then it's it's fine. That's what I'm doing. I just leave it on all the time. And then when I want to use an app full screen, I just kind of drag the app to the edge of the display. And then it always opens full screen. So it's, it's OK. Um, but there's times when you really appreciate it and times when you don't. The other thing we haven't mentioned is that this also enables proper external display support. Well, so you can now plug your iPad oh. into an external monitor and you can have windows across both devices, but it just behaves strangely because to send apps yeah. from one screen to another, you have to select an option on that app on the iPad. You can't use it mm. in clamshell. Mode. So it's that's it's what very I, weird. That's what I was going to bring up because, you know, as we're learning, you were an iPad user. Now you're not. So I want to know. <laughs> like I want to know where, like, where some of the things you know you're using Mac OS then primarily, right? Uh, yeah, I would say eighty percent of my daily usage is Mac. Okay, so to get everything that you need to get done and to keep your productivity level at an all time high, what are some of the differences that we can dive into a little bit more between the two operating systems that you appreciate more on Mac? Um, and then what can that what can be addressed for iPad? Because you know one of the big things for me is like what Hartley just said, external display support, as you know from the past, was just terrible. It was just mirroring yeah. your iPad, and it wasn't great. And now it does give you kind of a true desktop, like an external display, um, with the help of Stage Manager. And so you can use it like you would a normal Mac being plugged into an external display. So is mm -hmm. that something that could bring you back, or is there anything else that we want to change here? There are other things like I, I will call them nitpicks, but I think they're actually fundamental um, usability issues. The one caveat I'll throw out here is, you know, humans are molded by the tools that they use individually. So all of us are old enough to have been using desktop computers for the majority of our lives. And then we adapted to iPads somewhat within our workflow when the iPad came out or whenever it got usable. Uh, I watch like my wife's little cousins play games that I would never dream of playing on a touchscreen on the iPad. And they're just having a ball. Like they'll play Minecraft, Terraria, all these kind of things. And I'm like, why don't you plug in a controller? They're fine with it. So if the iPad is what feels good to you and a desktop platform doesn't feel good to you, then you're going to have a completely different perception of this whole thing. I'm coming from 20 years of desktop experience and then trying to find my way to sort of create a simulacrum of that on the iPad. Uh, with that being said, so recently my workflow has been mostly uh, going back and forth a lot between a browser, Notion, and VS Code. So that's three different spaces. Um, in many cases, I have two Notion windows side by side, which last time I checked, you could not do that on the iPad unless you brought Notion up in Safari and then use the official Notion app and side by side of those. But uh, in that case, I can't copy a block from one to the other, and I need to be able to do that. So that's one part of it. Uh, I found when coding on the iPad, even when I have the, uh, the little keyboard case with the touchpad, the mouse driver just doesn't quite feel as precise as it does on a Mac. And that is a big issue when you're trying to code. Yeah. I also found that uh, when you try to like highlight and select text, it doesn't always want to do it. And I'm not, I haven't figured out exactly why, but sometimes it just does not highlight and select text. And again, when you're coding, you need to be able to highlight and select text. And on my Mac with my mouse plugged in, I always have a mouse plugged in my Mac. I don't use a touchpad. Um, it just feels seamless, instant, frictionless. And of course it is a different trackpad. I think I completely agree. That's something that always holds me back. You know, I'm working with text all day, every mm -hmm. day. And this is one of the main things that I struggle to explain to people why I can't do it on the iPad, because in theory I can, but ultimately it's just the feel of it. It's the feel of selecting text. There's something about the latency of the, the trackpad. And the trackpad on the Magic Keyboard is also really small, even on the 12.9 yep. inch iPad. Yeah, and it doesn't tiny. use the, uh, the uh, force touch um, mm -hmm. feedback of the glass trackpads on the Mac. So it feels very different. And having a round cursor also just makes it feel more inaccurate. Um, yeah. So I, I can really I can really get behind that criticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really even see a reason to try to force myself to use an iPad for everything. They both fit in my backpack, especially now that the, I'm on the air, like that thing is about the same weight as an iPad. So 
the iPad can just be in there as a second monitor, or if I want to do something specifically with the Apple Pencil, like draw a diagram. When I was refinishing my basement, um, I took measurements of every wall and I used Notability on the iPad to draw a diagram with all the measurements. And that was actually really nice to have on the iPad because then I could sync it over to my phone. If I'm at Home Depot, I can bring up my measurements very easily. That was great. But anytime I've tried to code, uh, do any kind of like editing of text, it's, it's difficult in the iPad. Writing is totally fine. And I, I will get behind the idea that it does provide a more distraction free experience when you're writing. If you just bring open, uh, you know, Notion or Apple Notes or whatever, and you're just writing text, it does take a bit more effort to switch over to Twitter. And you could just keep Twitter off the iPad in the first place. And you could yeah. just say like, this is my writing device. That's all I do with it. It's almost like I purchased a typewriter, but it's not as heavy. <laughs> so I have a couple questions through all that. One, do, what's, what, do you, you don't use a trackpad at all for Mac OS either? Um, I mean, I guess if I'm on a plane, but I don't know that like I could my live. routine every day, I go to the coffee shop, I bring my bag and I've got my wireless mouse and my mouse pad. And I just get that out, and it just feels so much better than using okay. a trackpad. Thomas, I don't want to insult you, but I feel like I'm I'm getting a vision of my mother who has like the little mouse pad <laughs> and like the the pink like Logitech small tiny mouse that you plug into your laptop. <laughs> I don't think that's no, the definitely case. not. Okay. I have a I have a large actually my mouse pad is bigger than the M2 Mac. It's a hard <laughs> oh, so plastic gaming like mouse. Put it on top then, um, in the bag, yeah, I put I just put it in top on okay. top of each other. But yeah, I mean, I just put it next to each other. The coffee shop I go to has big tables. I have a uh, Logitech, I think it's like G603 Lightspeed gaming mouse. It's like nice. the best mouse. Right, right, right. And it just, I don't know, like maybe it does make me old. I think this is actually the mouse right here. Uh, G604, I got the number wrong. But working with a mouse just feels better and faster than working with a touchpad. And like, I would raise anybody doing the work that I've been doing recently, it's always gonna be faster than a mouse. So I don't disagree with you on that. I do, however, need the trackpad. So my setup is strange in which I don't have it here because I don't, this is just for podcasts, so I don't need it. But like mm -hmm. I use this, I can't get it straight here. So I use oh, this I know Logitech mouse. It's, yep. so, it's so incredible for my wrists um, and I love it. And the trackball, like once you go trackball life, it's really hard to like not go back to anything else. But like I use that. And then on my left-hand side, I have the the magic what the magic trackpad and i only oh, yeah. i only use that for the gestures i think the gestures are so useful that it's really hard okay. for me to miss out on those i do use the gestures okay so i guess that's yeah i didn't even think about that but i'm using the mouse blah, doing whatever i want and then when i want to switch spaces i do that okay yeah so it's you, you do have a since so you use your macbook like i'm using the mac studio so i i have to have something external so i put it over here on the left hand side and i'll use yep. the the trackpad for just swiping back and forth between full screen apps and getting the mission mm -hmm. control. Like that's where I think it's super helpful. So I'm glad that we're on the same page. I was gonna say, I, I don't, I can't use it 100% of the time unless I'm traveling, but like yeah. at my desk, I have to have both, I guess. Hartley, what yep, about you? I do like the gestures. Well, I'm, I'm all in on the magic trackpad. Okay. I have tried all using in. mice, all but in. yeah. So, so many, so many years of, you know, I keep trying uh, to use, uh, different mice. I've tried all the different Logitech products, but I think I've just got so used to Mac laptops over the years, and I just love the gestures. Um, but what I was going to suggest for uh, for you, Thomas, that you might like to try is actually connecting your mouse to the iPad um, in that kind of setup, because that yeah, way you're was, getting a little closer. Yeah, I was going to bring that up that I, I know I can do that, but I'm still going to have the issue where the the on-screen pointer just feels a little less precise yeah, because it's it, it's trying to represent a finger instead of a pointer. And it doesn't have that little sharp point showing you exactly where your text is going to go. And then the big issue is, at least in the apps I was using, that text selection bug, it just is a killer. And you never have that on macOS. The it one thing well I will say about the Mac uh, M2 Air, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but when you have tap to click on, the palm rejection on that trackpad is not as good as I'm used to on all the other laptops. And I think it's because it's such a small laptop and that trackpad is still big. I haven't noticed any problems, but I've heard people say that the trackpad, I will say the trackpad when you, when you uh, like not just tap, but actually fully click in, the fake kind of vibration click is different than the one on the MacBook Pros. It's not mm. as good there, I will say that. 
But like, yeah, I've heard a lot of keyboard and trackpad ha um, uh, hate for that, and I haven't had any problems besides just it feeling a little different. But that's an interesting it might one. just be the way. Like, I always, I don't even know why I do it. <clears throat> my keyboards are never straight on to my body; they're always angled a little oh, bit yeah. towards the right side of me. Oh yeah, I do. The and same. I think that causes my palm to just brush the touchpad. And if I have tap to click on, which I think if you're a trackpad user, you need it uh, to right click easily. But if you have it on, like I find myself just having my cursor go elsewhere when I'm typing a lot. It's very possible that I, it does happen to me and I'm so used to it that I just don't even know that it's going on. <laughs> very possible. It's like this has interrupted me, but I'm used to it at this point. Yeah. Like I just don't, it's like a second thing that just happens and I don't care because it's part, it's part of life. It's what happens. Yeah. Well, I usually, when I, because I use the mouse every day, I have tap to click turned off and okay. that has solved it. But it does mean if I'm using the trackpad on a plane or something, I have to turn it back on because if I want to right click, I can't do the little two finger hop thing. That's interesting. Um, so I think the other question that I have is a little off kind of topic of what we're talking about, but you brought up that your wife is an artist and she uses mm -hmm. her Apple Pencil. Um, First off, we should just have her come down and explain it to us because uh, <laughs> I want to know. I've been wanting to know this question for a while because I've, I I don't I'm not an artist at all. Um, but I wanted to know if, if the the is it Wacom? That's how they pronounce it. I think it's Wacom. Wacom or Wa Wacom? I, I have no idea. But I don't know. I used to say Wacom. I know that's wrong. So um, if that is can can be fully replaced by an iPad or does she still use both? So she wants to use both. Um, her biggest gripe with the iPad is it's not the tooling. There's really no feature that I think the Wacom has the iPad doesn't. Um, the biggest thing is the size. Wacom sells, like, I think you can get up to 32 inch tablets. Oh, wow. And she really wants one of those someday. Uh, and, the, you know, the biggest you can go with an iPad is 12.9 inches. So that's the biggest thing. But, you know, honestly, like, having watched her work, the iPad apps are just smoother overall. Like the Apple pencil is just so, so good. I mean, she's got a live inside uh, it, procreate, right? She doesn't use procreate actually. Oh, she wow. uses clip studio paint. I want to say, okay. Is what it's called. Um, and that actually has a, a syncing thing. So she can do it on windows with her Wacom tablet, or she can do it on the iPad. Uh, and I would say, you know, 90% of her usage right now is in the iPad. Part of it is, uh, I think you mentioned you have like wrist issues. She's been having wrist issues. So with the Apple Pencil, she was able to get these big foam grips that makes the Apple Pencil like huge. And that just doesn't work on a Wacom because the Wacom Pencil has little buttons to actually uh, do yeah. operations off of the pen and you can't cover those up with a foam grip. So in terms of ergonomics, Apple Pencil wins there. Uh, I guess you don't have the button so you can't like have a little macro on your pen, but that's not too much of a hindrance, I think. Does she use the original Apple Pencil or is it, the, or is it number two? She uses the new one. Okay, so does the grip that she have not get in the way? Because there is a little double tap that you can do to switch between the eraser and the... Yeah, but it's a motion sensor, so it should be. It should be good. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. I did not know about that. Um, she hasn't mentioned it, so I have to wonder if Clip Studio Paint doesn't support it or if she didn't know about it either. It's a system thing, right? It should be supported through... Or does the app have to take advantage of it? I think the app probably has to take advantage of it. But. Yeah, so I mean, you just double tap towards the base of the pencil and it can switch between mm -hmm. the eraser. It can switch between other tools, right? I think there's like a it little... It between your two most previously used tools, or I think you can configure it in settings. You can, you can go into settings and there's like two options, but you can change it. Um, and that's cool. I personally wish you could just do what you can do with a Microsoft like Surface, uh, where you can just flip it upside down and erase that way. But That is pretty cool. Yeah. I wish that we could do that here, but we can't. So that's my yeah. only gripe. Um, I'll ask her if she's heard about that uh, because you know the foam grip she got, the pencil still sticks out the back. So if it is near the bottom, I don't think it would hinder that. For um, the purposes of illustration, one thing we're actually expecting is a bigger iPad model next year. We're expecting a 14.2 inch iPad model. Oh, she so will want that if, instantly. <laughs> if size is the <laughs> issue, then. Um, that actually could be the perfect solution. And I think that with these other features, like we're talking about with Stage Manager, part of the problem is it feels quite cramped on an iPad. But when, mm -hmm. you're, when you now actually have Windows and you have these use cases for um, you know, serious illustration on the iPad, I think there is room for that, that larger model. Um, yeah. And actually... If they're coming the out with thing, that, she's going to buy it as instantly. <laughs> uh, 
The other thing that we haven't mentioned is one of the other new great features, really simple thing that really improves the use um, of the iPad is uh, a feature called Display Zoom, which actually lets you fit more on the display. It scales the iPad's display properly. Um, oh, cool. So a combination of these things with um, Display Zoom, the desktop class apps, and Stage Manager, it is going somewhere to making this uh, a much more interesting experience. So I definitely suggest that you you give it a try again, Thomas. It's it's worth it's worth another look. It's definitely weird. It's definitely different mm -hmm. to a desktop, but it's worth it's worth a it's worth a try. Cool. I'll have to see if I even have the option of using these features though, because I don't think I have the newest iPad. Oh, I know no. it's not an M1. So yeah, it's I mean it's still the yeah, pro. That's the thing. <clears throat> yeah. And it's the pro that's the current body style, but it doesn't have the M1. So I'm probably stuck back on some old features. Yeah, a well, lot of people are not very uh, happy about that. Yeah, then you can then you can test it out there. I'll probably um, just buy it and try it out and then let her use it and we'll just share it. <laughs> do that for sure. So Hartley, I want you to start off. Do you have any like I know cuz you're you're into things and and productivity just like I am, but you are a little more like I'm guessing you're more rigid. You stick with things. I have the problem of going and wanting to try every single Oh no, I'm the same. Oh, okay. I thought you, but uh, you still, or do you just kind of always come my, back? My addiction, you know, which, my... which, which month is it? And I'm using a different notes app. <laughs> so I have a question. I actually have two questions then. What's your favorite, Thomas, what's, aside from Notion, what's your favorite, you know, one that kind of works with all devices? I do think that's important because, you know, I, I like to switch between different operating systems, sometimes mostly between, you know, iOS and Android. And I do want that to be there. Um, mm -hmm. But like, I think it's important. What's your favorite app that's not Notion that you think we should check out? Um, or if there's like an up and coming one that you've seen. And then um, my second question would be, how do I cure the addiction that I have where I want to test everything out? Is it just that, oh, I I need to to find, that, that I need to find something that works that I don't want to leave? Is that what happened to you? Uh, so for the first question, what are you specifically looking for or looking to do? Is it note taking tasks? Like, is there yes. a specific <laughs> both? Okay. So, so, I think, so here's I think... the thing. Okay. There's not really a lot of good apps out there. No, I, I would argue maybe none that truly have nailed tasks and note management. It's literally why I made my Notion template Ultimate Brain because I wanted to do both inside of one app, and I can't think of another app where I could do it. Uh, so I spent like five years learning Notion and then building that out. I, there's a couple that I've tried. Evernote recently brought in a tasks feature. Um, there's a lesser known company called Zenkit. And they have always always had this Zen kit to do, which is literally Wonderlist <laughs> recreated because Wonderlist uh, was bought by Microsoft and shut down. And then they recently released a note taking app called Hypernotes. It's very Rome Research esque. It does the whole unlinked references, knowledge graph, Zettelcast, and thing, but it does integrate with their Zen kit to do. So that is sort of like a pair of apps that sort of form a suite that can do both. Um, and I think those are cross-platform. When you when you ask like I want it cross-platform, especially including Android, that narrows the pool. I mean, that's not so much. That's not as important. But I, I am trying to, yeah. you know, it, for personally for me, it's got to work on. It's got to be. It definitely needs to be iOS and macOS. Um, yeah. An iPad would be a bonus, but I want something that I can quickly check tasks and stuff here. Um, and then notes for Mac OS and like be able to see everything all in one because my current workflow is kind of lame, but like, it's just what I've been stuck with and it's hard for me to get out of it cause I'm so used to it, but I do all of my scripting and everything in notes, Apple notes, and then to do list just kind of, it's, you know, take your pick, whatever is the flavor of the month. And I just haven't found anything yeah. that like, <laughs> that I can just keep up with. I don't know. If you want it all in one, there's a reason notion. that I'm on notion. Um, yeah. And I mean, like this isn't because I chose to be a notion fanboy. in 2019, I made a video called the top 10 note taking apps in 2019. That video took me, I think two months to make because in addition to the research, I got so frustrated with little, um, I guess like every, every single app had something I couldn't do. And I went down a rabbit hole of almost starting a company to build what you're asking for right now, realized you can it's still incredibly, do it incredibly, incredibly hard. And I don't want to do it. 
it's a, it's like you start you start designing stuff in Figma and you're like, oh, I got my features I want. This is so exciting and fun. And then you go, wait a minute, I'm going to be hosting user generated content, including potentially illegal things that I'm going to have to police. Like, oh, this is way way harder than I initially thought. That, and that's yeah. the biggest reason. It's like hosting user generated content, keeping it secure, keeping it easy to access. Like. I do not envy the Notion developers. I'm very glad that I get to build on top of that platform and just sell templates. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, it's really tough. I want to say, like when I was doing this, I loved Ulysses so much. I love Ulysses because you could do the whole thing where you could have notes in in like one folder, but then you can have a subfolder and you could sort in the notes view and see everything within the subfolders plus stuff that's just within the main folder. That's amazing for writers. I really wanted to go all in on that, but obviously not on Windows and the iOS app I think was lacking at the time. So I just decided, you know what, I'm going to figure out how to make Notion work for me. Uh, and at that time it was much harder than it is now because they have introduced a lot of new quality of life features. At this point, like I will readily admit task management as a singular task is better on Todoist or Microsoft Todo or Asana or something like that. But I haven't found anything that truly merges those two core things, note taking and task slash project management like Notion does. As a Notion fan, have you tried Craft, which is a, uh, it's a Mac and I iPadOS native uh, note taking alternative? Because it's a very similar to Notion in a lot of respects with blocks. Mm -hmm. And it, although it's definitely different, it's not quite as feature rich. Um, it's yes. an interesting new player in, in that space. Yeah, I tried Craft maybe a couple of years ago. I haven't tried it since. Uh, I've, I've kind of gone all in and I spend a lot less time experimenting with new features. I uh, just find that if I want to make the best Notion resource possible, that's like all, my, all I can use with my time. Uh, but yeah, when I did try it out, it was really cool. They definitely like nailed the UX. The animations felt smoother. It was just like, it was very fun to use. Um, the data model didn't quite click with me. And I think it's just because I have oh, the way I work in Notion already. But it's really, really interesting. Another very interesting one specifically for note taking is Obsidian. And that one is cross platform. They recently came out with their iOS app. Not sure about Android. Um, and the big, the big thing that put me off of using it for a long time was the fact that it used that very old school markdown method where you wrote in plain text in the editor window, and yeah. then you had a preview window with your formatting. Uh, pretty recently they had a, what you see is what you get editor come out where you actually can see your formatting as you type. Um, I still have, notes about it. If I paste in an image, I don't get to see the image right in context. Uh, URLs are still fully expanded instead of just being able to hyperlink things. I've become now addicted to little uh, expanded preview bookmarks for URLs that I can create a notion. So I'm a little spoiled on certain things, but uh, in other use cases, Obsidian is really cool for note taking. Obsidian's the app I I just moved out of to go back to Apple Notes. That that oh, yeah? was my that was one Obsidian held me for the longest time. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing with Craft that I would say, um, particularly you know as a as a Mac uh, as a Mac focused site and an and a, and a organization that is focused on Apple platforms, um, I also like Dan felt the learning curve with Notion. And if you're in the Apple ecosystem. Craft is a great way to kind of get your head around what Notion is trying to do. So mm -hmm. if if you're struggling to get on with Notion, Craft can, at least in my case, help me get how to use Notion, uh, which is a yeah. kind of a strange way of thinking about it, but it's because it's a native experience. And it's sort of the same concept. That, it just reduces a bit of friction. There's another one, uh, and if you're not a only Mac person, it's called Slight, S-L-I-T-E. And it uses that same or very similar block style of editor, but then it has a more traditional app UI and navigation structure. So instead of literally just canvases where you create your own everything, you have your drill down navigation panes, and then you can get into a document and you can do the sort of block style editing. Uh, I also wouldn't be a good entrepreneur and self promoter, I guess, if I didn't mention, I have a free series called Notion Fundamentals. So if you're trying to learn Notion, just Google that. <laughs> I, I go mean, from like literal blank page. I mean, at the end of the day, everything you're describing sounds like I just need to buy one of your templates because it feels like <laughs> it's going to give me everything that I need. Not just saying that. I'm like, ah, man, the more you keep talking about it, the more I just need to devote some time. It's, that's the thing that stinks. It's like everybody wants it now, myself included. And mm -hmm. you're just, it's not going to be, you know, the templates certainly help you get up and running. 
but you still need to learn how to edit the templates to customize it to the way you want to. And it is yep. going to take some time. But once you put in the time, I can see it being useful. I think another big thing for me is that like I want other people in our organization to use it. And mm -hmm. it's just like that's a that's a tall ask to give, you know, people so you can make it less of a tall ask. And this is where I recommend everyone start with Notion. Instead of saying, we're gonna go all in on this all-in-one tool and we're gonna do everything that we do here. Instead, like the easiest way to start is, okay, Notion's where our wiki is. So we're gonna document like SOPs, where it's like, okay, this is how you publish a podcast episode, or this is how you um, upload footage to our server, or this is how you make a social media thing. It's so easy to document in Notion um, there's like, cause you can just use screenshot apps and you can paste directly into the canvas. You can use loom to record screencasts and paste directly to notion. And then you can just be like, cool. Our wiki's there. That's where we have our team wiki and people get used to a specific use case. And then you go, oh, well, maybe we could try a little bit of basic project management here. And I, I recommend that for any tool, not just notion. Um, pretty much all project management tools are incredibly powerful and have a lot of features but it's it's really difficult to get multi-person team adoption for any tool if you try to do everything at once so i'd instead pick like one use case and go let's just try this out and see if it becomes our preferred tool for that thing that's a good idea i think i probably just throw like we're gonna do this on this one we're gonna we're gonna do notes we're gonna do tasks <laughs> we're gonna you're gonna make a kanban style board like that's what we're doing and people are like mm -hmm. i don't even know if i want to do this to begin with so yeah. yeah i feel like you you're my you might be a little bit of a systems builder and a tinkerer like i am uh, yeah. And there's the temptation we have to avoid to try to get everyone on all these new custom systems we've created r like right away overnight. So if you just, I don't know, if you just get them doing one little thing. And this, the, the fun thing I've found with Notion is when you get people doing one thing there, they tend to discover the other tools on their own. And then they like, there's so many people who have come to me and go, oh, I get it now. <laughs> Now I'm building all these cool things. Um, one of the the YouTubers in uh, Nebula, the sort of creator collective that I part own, was like, I guess I'm going to try your Notion template because I need something to manage my channel. And that was a few months ago. And then just the other day, he's like, I love this so much. And I created all these cool task management formulas. And I'm going to share them in your community. And I've built like this whole dashboard for myself that tells me how many tasks I have left for the week. And I'm like, dang, I don't even know how to do that. So See, there you go. <laughs> Let's hope in six months I come back to you and tell you the same thing. Because then, <laughs> then that means we're all happy and organized. Because right now I'm working with slightly organized chaos over here. Like I know what I need to get done <laughs> and eventually it gets done. But like then there are things that I'm like, oh, I had that idea and I totally forgot what it was. And, you know, I already have mm -hmm. horrible memories. So, you know. We'll see. One cool little thing that I added in, and I would love to see this in any other task management app, um, because you can sort of do whatever you want in Notion. I was like, you know what? I had a lot of tasks to my task list that I never do. And then I get like overwhelmed with what I am doing. So I never clear them off my task list. I just wrote a little formula that says, if this task isn't high priority, then it just gets taken off my task list in 14 days. And it goes to like a safe little storage locker. So it's not deleted, but it's like, it's not That's on my, right. this is due today list due today yeah. things that were due two weeks ago and and that's the whole struggle i have with like brain dumping things in there because it's just useless stuff half the time and then i'm mm -hmm. like well i don't know if i didn't have time to go back and do all of this and categorize it like now i have to go back and delete it all or figure out a use case for it so that is actually pretty useful yeah i end up doing yeah, that manually. Yourself. was that yeah i oh, I, I, I i yeah i because I, where i use things three that's what I have to yep. do. I have to manually empty my inbox. But I find sometimes, you know, I could add 100 tasks a day to my inbox quite easily, maybe up to 150, mm -hmm. especially with quick add on Mac OS. It's just so intuitive, you know, in a whole working day. That's a lot yep. of thoughts that I can just, you know, stick in that system. So I find I just end up then dumping them into Apple Notes and thinking, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go through that one day. And I yep. probably won't. It's like the dirty secret of productivity and productivity gurus. We're all just like, you need to have a day every week where you process your systems. Uh, and if you ask me, do I process my systems every week? No, I do not. So <laughs> I recognize that about myself and I went, okay, if I put it on my to-do list two weeks ago and I haven't done it and I haven't said, I'm going to go reset its to-do date, it wasn't that important to me. Like my yeah. life is still moving on. And, and again, it's not deleted. If I ever go, what was it? Whatever happened to that thing I was going to do? I know where to find it. It's just not gunking up the list where I have my stuff I'm actually going to do. Makes sense. All right. Mm -hmm. I guess you've convinced me. I'll give it another shot. Everyone go <laughs> check out his templates. 
Hartley, do you have anything else to add before we uh, before we wrap up? Well, I think the last thing to kind of touch back on iPad, um, mm -hmm. I would like to know in terms of we talked a lot about software and we talked a little bit about the trackpad with hardware, but where would you want to see iPad going um, in the long term to actually make it a more useful productivity tool? Both, you know, we talked a lot about software, but maybe in terms of hardware, what would it need to do? Would it need to be lighter? Anything about the display? Or do you think it's just good where it is? Mm. The display is good. I think the, you know, it's hard to ask for it to be lighter because it's packing all the same battery and internal hardware that your MacBook is in that screen form factor. Um, you know, this is going to sound like a Luddite take, but I just want Mac OS in my iPad. I want to go, you know what? I want to just like thought. use that today. Maybe, yeah. and maybe it is. And maybe I want to do some note taking and that my MacBook doesn't have a touch screen. It doesn't work with the Apple pencil, but then I want to throw it on the little keyboard case and I want to just have Mac OS with the perfect mouse drivers and the gestures and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, and I think the windows world has basically tried to give us that in between with like the, the transforming laptops that can bend all the way over and become a tablet. Um, you know, and then you deal with windows as mouse or uh, touchpad and, and pencil drivers, which aren't quite as good. So, that would be my ass. Like, give me a cool transforming MacBook that's basically half Mac, half iPad. <laughs> Might be coming, right? I mean, with the foldable thing, right? Foldable iPad, you yeah. know, with more optimization for iPad OS. You know, if Stage Manager finally gets there, they know that they're bringing it closer to the Mac. They are addressing mm -hmm. these issues, but it, they've got to they've got to resolve these little details. Whether it's copy and pasting calendar yes. or it's the it's the uh, the, the mouse drivers ultimately. Um, so I yep. think that's that's exactly it. Even if they don't give it Mac OS, uh, iPad OS needs to, needs to get there. Do you have any thoughts, Dan, about where the iPad needs to go? I mean, I'm a Luddite just like Thomas mentioned. I want, I want, <laughs> I want Mac OS on an iPad. I mean, that's what I want, honestly. And I know mm -hmm. that that's not going to happen and they're just going to do it their own way and refine it to make it close, but still separate. But like, I don't know. If they're not going to do that, then you make your foldable, you know, large screen device and you put Mac OS on it with iPad OS. Like make if it doesn't need to be an iPad, but then give me a Mac that can do the cool transforming thing with some sort of limited iPad OS experience for when you do. And the thing with Surface is that it actually gives you the ability to get out of that if you don't want it. So you could mm -hmm. in that transformed mode still just be running straight up Windows and there's no limitations. But like I do like the idea of it automatically giving me some limitations because maybe there's some things that I just I don't know that I don't want them on right now. Let Apple decide that for me, but also give me the ability to go back to straight Mac OS if I want to. But at that point, you're probably wondering, well, why wouldn't they just put Mac OS on an iPad? That just seems a lot easier. And then we're all back to the same conversation that we're having right now. <laughs> yep. Why do you think they don't put Mac OS on an iPad? Do you think it's like a sales cannibalization thing or just them being quirky? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably most of it, right? Like, otherwise, mm. why, then they're probably like, well, then why do we need an iPad? Why don't we just make a touchscreen Mac? And people are just going to be like, well, then do like, that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's like the, the TikTok guy, like, yeah, uh -huh, that's yeah, what we want. <laughs> exactly. Just do that then. Or, you know, or give us both. Like, they're, you know, there is still reasons to have, you know, an iPad like device and portability and all that. Um, and it's just, I don't know. I, we're just going to keep running around in circles. So, mm -hmm. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Truly appreciate it. Would you like to plug all of your endeavors? I know we've talked about it a lot, but I think just a more systematic approach of what you got going sure. on. Yeah, I'll plug three things. My main focus right now is teaching people Notion. So thomasjfrank.com slash fundamentals is my completely free beginner series. If you are the person who is like, I don't get Notion, it starts from a literal blank blank page and then it's very project based. So it teaches you how to build stuff on the way. Um, thomasjfrank.com slash templates is where you can go to find templates. I've got a lot of free ones and a couple of paid ones. And then Tom Frankly on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. So if you want to chat, that's where to go. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Truly appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on the show. This was fun.